wanted to remind myself to say <clears throat> that um, based on a comment someone made a few weeks ago that at the bottom of every email that you may get from me, you have the links to this schedule and you have the links to um, our Slack site. I have decided at long last, even though I've run that Slack site for um, activities here at Harper for about five years, I'm going to retire it um, probably before the beginning of summer. I'm going to replace it with a Discord site. If you don't know about Discord, it, it's a chat social media site that's private. It can be um, by invitation only, and it probably will be for our site. And there can be topics in there um, for stats questions, R and Python code questions, things like that. And that will become our new chat place. Teams has replaced some of the functionality of Slack since it rose up over lockdown, but um, I still want a site separate to Teams that doesn't require that at least that I can administrate doesn't require that administrative burden of managing teams. Also wanted to remind people that for every meeting on these links, other than the uh, the very recent one, so this is today's meeting and there's no YouTube link yet, but for every other meeting or almost all of them, there's a um, recording of the meeting unedited. So some of them are probably not that pleasant to watch, but they're there in case people miss the meeting and want to see it, and it's an interesting topic. Um, and the link to the slides today is active, so I'm going to go ahead and open that if you'd like to follow along, and I'm going to begin. So uh, it's our final boot camp week. It's uh, boot camp 12. We started this a bit more than 12 weeks ago. I think we probably started it about 16 weeks ago and took a few weeks off for uh, Christmas and uh, some time I was away traveling. But the time has flown and um, it's been pretty good. What we're doing today, I forgot to change this uh, 11 to a 12. Uh, what we're doing to uh, today is we are talking about ANOVA. Now, ANOVA analysis of variance is one of the commonest modern statistics tools. We're, we're talking about specifically one-way ANOVA today, just to, how to use it. Nice thing is that <clears throat> ANOVA is a linear model, and uh, any kind of linear model, even a simple one-way ANOVA, simple linear regression, um, or more complicated ones that have multiple explanatory variables and mixed effects and all of that stuff essentially works exactly the same way. There are a lot different nuances to it, but um, the point of the boot camp is to give the basics, which is the steepest part of the learning curve. And then uh, even though a lot of refinement and other specific topics are out there, that you, you have enough of the basics to um, refine your own journey. Now, we use ANOVA, one-way ANOVA, when uh, we were talking last week about the t-test, where if you have a two-sample t-test, you're comparing exactly two groups. But ANOVA is the case where you have more than two groups. I wanted to say a little bit about, about this fellow. If any of you have been in my office, um, You'll notice I have a portrait of this guy in my office, and I have to admit he's a bit of a, I don't have many heroes, but uh, he's a bit of a academic hero to me. Not not because I'm, I have a personality that needs to, to uh, have a hero, far from it, but because he did so many of the things, laying the foundations for the tools I use every day and the things that I'm interested in and care about, and uh, I could spend a long time telling you what he's done in the world of statistics. He created, he's credited with created, creating most of the modern foundations of the statistical tools that we do. Specifically, I mentioned Ronald Fisher today because he created ANOVA. I've made a reference before to the F test. Um, that is the test statistic he wrote a lot of papers about that 
underlies ANOVA. Um, but I, even though I am known as a statistician and self-identify as a statistician, I began my academic career as a geneticist. I studied genetics as an undergrad, and I encountered Fisher as an undergraduate because he, um, if you have ever studied genetics, especially if you've ever studied evolution, you might be aware of um, the a group of statisticians and biologists who um, studied natural selection and invented the field of, of population genetics. And this was at a time <clears throat> before we knew about um, DNA. And uh, there was a missing link between Charles Darwin's uh, uh, theory of natural selection and the the basis upon which natural selection acted, the the basic units of inheritance. And Ronald Fisher was part of uh, this group of population biologists <clears throat> with um, Sewell Wright and a few other people. And uh, Fisher was um, the best statistician and mathematician amongst them. And that was uh, that was amongst a, a really strong crowd. And uh, he wrote a book called The Genetic Basis. Well, uh, I think it's um, The Genetical Basis of Natural Selection is the name of the book, but it was about the how genetic units transmitted by heredity would affect evolution, effect evolution. So he, uh, he was the first to describe that. So he, um, <clears throat> also mathematically described sexual selection for the first time. And uh, he had this brilliant history at Rothamsted Station where he um, created ANOVA, helped um, William Gossett publish about the T-test. He argued in his letters with, um, <clears throat> with Pearson about the correlation coefficient. So he really did invent almost all of statistics. Maximum likelihood is another tool he invented uh, and is credited with, which is the foundation of Bayesian statistics and much of artificial intelligence these days. So I just thought I'd tip the hat to him when we um, starting off here. All right, the question of one way ANOVA is uh, what we're going to start with today. And just like the other meetings, we're going to go through the data and the assumptions, the typical way of graphing. Um, when we have categorical variables in a continuous dependent, just like with the t-test, we're going to be making a box plot, but with more boxes. So this is a reiteration of, of the appropriate graph. We're going to talk about the um, actually conducting an ANOVA, how to interpret the results, what it looks like in R, and what the alternatives are. Um, the alternative, if your data don't meet the assumptions of ANOVA, is the Kruskal-Wallis test. And uh, post-hoc tests will do as well. And um, then there are the practice exercises, which we probably will not have time for. OK, so the question of one way ANOVA is, well, this is the case when we're comparing more than two means. And uh, um, again, the samples for each of these, uh, these samples of means are independent. Each individual observation is independent. That, for example, means if you're um, if you're measuring something about an individual animal or a plant, that uh, that each of the samples is unrelated with respect to the treatments to any other sample. Or another way of saying that, if you're an experimenter, is that uh, any of the any of the samples that you collect, any of the observations on an individual, had an equal likelihood of of being assigned. To, uh, to any of the treatments. The central question we're asking is, are the means different overall? This is a, a bit of a subtlety that uh, sometimes I find isn't clear in, in the minds of uh, experimenters, is, um, but it helps at an early stage to think specifically about this, is that um, <clears throat> when we conduct a, an ANOVA test, we're asking overall, is there any variance uh, that is uh, significantly different between the means, any of the means, no matter how many that we have? And a separate question is, uh, are there differences between specific groups? 
and traditionally we we view this question as the principal question of analysis of variance. Overall, is there a difference? And uh, this kind of question, are there specific differences between specific groups? For example, if you have a control treatment one and treatment two, a question you might ask here is, uh, is the control different from treatment one specifically? Or is the control different from treatment two specifically? These are often called post hoc tests. They're called post hoc or after the fact tests because um, first we ask whether there is an overall difference. And then after the fact, we ask about the specific differences if we care about those. And, I, and you know, this is all in that framework, the null hypothesis, significant testing. And we're going to look at the data, continuous dependent variable, categorical, explanatory variable, and uh, wide versus long data. So first, we're going to just look at how the data look. This is a bit of a review from last time. I just um, <clears throat> go to the boot camp page and um, go down to the data and assumptions. It's the first time that we encounter this. First, I'm going to look at the data in um, wide format. Now, um, this data is, um, I believe, see if there's an, uh, an account of the data. I need to go back and um, describe the data a little bit better, maybe make it more obvious in the code. But uh, this is a animal genetics study looking at the weight of, um, of male chickens. So we're holding sex in the chickens constant, and it's the eight week old weight in grams. And um, so that's the dependent uh, variable, the measurement of the weight in grams. And um, the factor here is the uh, sire identity. Kind of some of you probably do do animal genetics, maybe even some of you do chicken genetics. Um, this is a, a rather old fashioned way to do it, but still in wide practice of uh, looking at the genetic contribution of the sire independent of the dam. So these are um, weights that we're going to create, and we've got a factor here for each of the sires. OK, so I'm just going to grab the data. So um, I'm just going to select these and enter them. All of them will pop up in the global environment. Yell if um, you want me to slow down or the text is too big or too small. Three, two, one. There we go. So we've got our variables up here. And then I'm just going to use that data frame function to combine these data objects, A through E, uh, into a um, variable called chicken.wide, a wide format of the data. And I wrap that all in the head function. You remember the head function um, will <clears throat> we'll just print the first few rows of data so we can see what it looks like. If you can watch two places at once, you can see the chicken.wide pop up up in the global environment and the head of the data set pop up down in the console, three, two, one. There we go. We've got it. We can look at the structure of the data. It's exactly the same as the variables, but now they're inside the data object called chicken.wide. And here's what it looks like. OK, great. <clears throat> so I mentioned that long format is preferred. And um, I didn't mention exactly why it was preferred in detail, but um, it it really is a trivial matter as to which format you enter your data into the spreadsheet. It's just that a lot of software these days um, natively will perform this kind of test on long format data. And the, you remember the long format data would restructure this data uh, where rather than there being five columns like this, A through E, it would instead, uh, and each of these columns, by the way, just the name indicates the sire. Um, and each of the the um, the entries, each of the cells 
all measure the same thing, no matter which column it's in. It's all the <clears throat> the weight in grams of those chicks or young chickens. Um, long format data will restructure this so that we have one column that denotes sire and just one column for each of the, the weights. This is um, long format, I should say, is if you remember way back, I mentioned that concept of tidy data. And a wide format data violates the uh, principles of tidy data, which is considered best practice. So uh, the, the fact that, that even though I say that it doesn't really matter how you enter your data, um, the principle of tidy data, specifying that it should be in long format, uh, and the fact that most software will expect long format probably suggests that you should aim to, to enter your data in long format and it's better. Okay, so uh, I've already done this part here, so I'm just going to grab um, this part. Let me make sure that that's the, um, the same. I think it is. It's going to make a... Uh, <clears throat> Here, what I'm doing is I am um, creating a um, a single vector of all of those weights. Let me just print out the A. See, I have it selected there, three, two, one. And uh, when I combine it in the concatenate function, it just makes a long string of all the weights in order A, B, C, D, and E, like that. And I've put them in a a variable I've called weight. And uh, because they're in order, I'm making a variable called sire, where um, here I'm, I'm wrapping all of this in the C function to make a long string of values. Inside each one, I'm using the rep function, which replicates some value. Here, we're going to replicate the value uh, A, the letter A, in a string eight times. So if we just see what this bit of the code does, three, two, one, it just makes um, eight A's. That's all it does. Now this little share this window bit is is irritating me down here. I want to try to get rid of that. Hmm, I don't know what window that's from. No, I don't. I guess I can get around it by um, just entering a few times. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wrap this whole thing in a parenthesis so that it automatically prints out down in the console. Um, three, two, one, boom. And if I enter a few times so you can see it, all we have now is a string of sire um, identities. And, and remember, it's in the order of design this so that it puts the A's uh, in the order of the weights so that it maintains the um, integrity of um, the relationship between the weights that were measured and the identity of the sire, that's the whole point. And then I'm just going to make a, uh, a new data frame. This is what that data frame would look like. I haven't put it into a, um, a data um, object here yet, but here's what the head would look like, three, two, one. So that's what it looks like. Now we've just got the two columns. Each one is an individual in a row. That's best practice. That's tidy data. And uh, it looks like um, looks like I'm missing a bit of code here. I think uh, I should put this into a data frame called chicken long. Oh, and I do do the new long. So I'll wait. I'll wait. Do it, and I'll go through all of this code. So I don't want to jump ahead of the lessons I maybe um, have put in here and have forgot about since the last time I did this. But we're looking at the tail of the sire weight. So we can see what the, um, the uh, end of it did. And that should be the E males. And certainly it is. Then um, I think I go through this process of showing a more programmatic way more like a programmer might approach this rather than a normal scientist. And uh, let's just have a look at what I've done here. Well, the programming way 
is that I've made a new variable. This time I'm calling it weight one. Now it will be identical to regular weight, but just for um, completeness, I've made a, a new variable. It's identical to the first one. I've made a sire one. And uh, here I've initialized a place to hold the data with the vector um, function. And I'm telling it that I want um, the, this vector to be a character vector. And I want it to have a length of 40 spaces. Um, eight times five is 40. So I'm being very specific now about initializing the sire. One of the nice things about R is we, we don't have to do this, but best practice um, as a programmer would would probably suggest you'd want to do this so that you know you control everything and it's exactly as you expect it to be. So like I said, this is the programmatic way to do it. So I've made sire. You can see it here and there um, are spaces for values I haven't filled out yet. And um, then here, I'm not going to talk through this whole thing because this is getting into some programming stuff. But for those of you who are interested in it, I'll just make this um, look a little bit different so that it's um, easier to see. I'm using a for loop and I'm looping um, i for one to five, one for each of the sires. And um, if I just set i to one, and I look at this letters function, notice that's a capital letters function. It's one of the built-in data sets in R, and I'm going to ask it, what letter is um, letter one? Because I've set I to one. Three, two, one. It's it's A. So this is a, just a vector of the capital letters of the alphabet, the English alphabet. <clears throat> Here I'm creating sire one, and I'm doing it <laughs> in a programmatic way to step or based on the value of i um, 1 through 40. Now, because there are, um, there are um, eight observations for each of the ones, and the first time through, I'm doing the multiplication of uh, 8 times 1, which is 8 minus 8. So this is zero. And then I'm adding to it uh, one through eight. So this will resolve to the values of one through eight. And when the for loop clicks up to the second one, this will be eight times two, 16 minus eight is eight plus one to eight. So it'll be the values nine to 16. So this is just a programmatic way of going through um, the five different letters one at a time. So keep your eye over here on the sire one variable. I'm just going to run the for loop, three, two, one, boom, there it is. It's created an identical vector to previous sire, three, two, one, just in a programmatic way. And I will look at the head of the data frame, three, two, one, and it looks the same. This is two alternatives, one uh, sort of the um, the R way and another one a more formal programmatic way, just um, just for fun. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, we can go back and forth with uh, these, but I'm, I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip over this code. Um, but there are many ways to do things in R. And uh, one of the ways to to reshape your data from, let's say, wide format to long format is with a package called uh, reshape. It's got a, a one called melt. Oh, heck, let's just do it. But I'm going to have to speed up if we're going to get through everything. Let's load the library, We've load it, and then we can just perpetrate melt on our wide data. So remember what the wide data looks like, three, two, one. Oops. Select just the correct part. There we go. And if we use melt on it, if we bring up the help menu for melt. <clears throat> it um, it will um, just take a data frame. And what's going to happen here is it's going to guess what we want. So let's 
just look at it, three, two, one. And it it guessed 100 percent correctly <laughs> that that uh, we had a variable and we had some value and um, we're going to put it into a, a new data object called new dot long three, two, one. There we go. <clears throat> now, did it make new long? Yes, it did. In a little warning message here. It said um, there are no ID variables, and I think it's probably since I wrote this um, code, there's been an update and it wants you to, to tell it the value name. So it's just letting me know that it's made an assumption about that. And the assumption it made was <clears throat> to assign um, just the generic name of variable and value. OK. So uh, we have already looked at that. Um, we also can change the name so that we don't get confused and it's easier to read our code. So we can grab the names out of our data object. This little pop up is really irritating me, but I, I'm not going to pause to get rid of it. Let me know if I need to pause to get rid of it, if it's bothering you guys, but I think I'll just tab past it like I have been. So the names in our new data set are variable and value, like we saw. And uh, what we may want to do is just, um, oops, is just um, like we have done before, take the names value slots in our data frame and put in the names we prefer. In this case, we're going to replace them with uh, sire and weight. Three, two, one. Now they've been changed, and that's looking just fine. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I guess my tip is that you should probably just use long format um, for your your data in the first place, and that, that probably is the best advice. OK, so the assumptions of ANOVA, I think it's back to the um, slides now, just for a second. And um, well, you won't be surprised about these assumptions because we've already talked about them. We do have, again, the assumption of uh, Gaussian or, or normal distribution for the residuals. Um, we also have a, uh, an assumption about the homoscedasticity, the equality of variance. What that means here is that the variance in each of the um, in each of the categories is equal. Um, and more complicated uh, linear models uh, make the same exact assumptions. Uh, so these are exactly the same as we talked about for the t-test, which is related to ANOVA and other linear models, also regression, and also the independent observations. OK, so let's look at the. Um, the code for this. <clears throat> so um, for the Gaussian residuals, now uh, a lot of times it's natural for us to, this is in uh, section four, a lot of times it's natural for us to want to test our assumptions um, before we do any statistics. You know, it doesn't really make sense to uh, to do the statistic first and then test the assumption. But but actually, that second way I said it, even though it cognitively doesn't make sense, is the way we have to do it. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, we need to perform the model calculation in order to calculate the residuals. OK, we, we could do it by hand, of course, but um, that's um, that's um, you know takes a long time to do that. Just trying to look at where we're going. I'm going to also grab this QQ plot code. All right. So the code that we've got here, I'll just make it a little bit bigger for everyone. Is um, now the the vanilla analysis of variance function that we use all the time. This is a bit of a one of the little eccentricities of R, it's called AOV, standing for analysis of 
variance. And the uh, the way we usually think of the test analysis of variance is ANOVA. And the most confusing thing in, in R is that we use the, the function called AOV to calculate an analysis of variance, but we use the function ANOVA, which I'll show you in a few minutes, to format the, uh, the output of a model. It's a little eccentricity, but um, so we're going to calculate here the uh, analysis of variance of weight as a function of sire, and we're going to use our new long data, and we're going to put that data into our M1 variable. I'm just going to call it M1 for model one. Three, two, one. Got our model pop up up here. Now notice if I click down and let's look at it, inside this model object, there's loads of stuff. There's loads of stuff. Some of it looks daunting, but um, one of them is the residuals. And uh, that's why we're calculating the model first in order to examine the residuals. Okay, so we've got, um, I'm going to set up and display two graphs at the same time. So I'm setting my MF row parameter to uh, have one uh, row and two columns, three, two, one. That will do nothing. It just makes it so that if we, if we create a single graph, and here I'm going to graph a histogram of the residuals for M1. And um, if I print, if I just print what M1 is in its naked format, it gives me a little bit of information about what it is. It says that it's it's an analysis of variance, its weight is a function of sire, and it gives me the sum of squares for the sire variable and the residuals. Um, gives me degrees of freedom. We'll talk about these when I look at the regular ANOVA output. And, and it gives a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, other information, but th this isn't what we expect when we do a statistical test. We'll come on to this. We expect to see the p-value and and the test statistics. So we'll we'll get onto that first. We're going to make a histogram of the residuals. If I if I do the R standard, that's the standard residuals for um, for this model. It'll print out. A vector of all of the residuals. There are 40 of them, and these are the residual values for each of the individual means. Right. So um, let's go ahead and print this. Three, two, one. We can see that they look pretty good. They look Gaussian. They look like a normal bell-shaped curve. And uh, then I'm going to type the QQ plot. Remember that's in the car library. So I'll load that, and we're going to make the QQ plot of our object. Um, three, two, one. There we go. And what are we looking at on here? We're looking for deviation on this QQ plot um, at the ends primarily, or any systematic shapes in there. And this looks pretty good. So I'm really satisfied that this is um, this ad adheres to the assumption of Gaussian residuals. <clears throat> and then I'm just going <clears> to <throat> turn my um, plots <clears throat> back to have just a single column and row. All right, so that's the first um, assumption. Second assumption that we've looked at is this Shapiro test, a formal test of whether there are Gaussian residuals. <clears throat> And uh, remember what the Shapiro test does. It just is is um, asking the question: <clears throat> Is my data different to to normal or different to Gaussian? And here, the data we're concerned of, of course, is still the um, the residuals. If you're in doubt, and I'm not going to take the time to discuss the standard. Um, residuals of uh, the, the normal residuals versus the standardized residuals. But if you're ever in doubt, just use the standardized residuals. Maybe we can talk about that in a future meeting. So let's just do the test. Three, two, one. 
And what we see here is our, we get the test statistic and the p-value. P-value is way bigger than 0.05, and that means that our, our data are not different to normal. That's a positive outcome. We don't have to worry about anything for, um, for that assumption. Second thing we're going to do is look at um, homoscedasticity. And to do that, we make a plot that looks like this, where we plot the residuals on the y-axis, and we look at the fitted values of the chickens, in this case, on the x-axis. So this is a, a residuals as a function of fitted values, and this is one of the standard diagnostic plots for all linear models, including regression. I didn't show this model when we went through regression, but it's one of the models uh, it's one of the plots I would look at every single time I run any linear model. So it's one of the standard ones. So I'm just going to do the code. Okay, so um, what we're doing here is I'm using the plot function to um, <clears throat> plot the standard residuals as a function of the fitted values, which is just the linear range of the dependent variable, and, uh, and making the <clears throat> labels. And then on it, I'm going to put a, a line, a horizontal line at zero. And uh, what we're looking for in this, in this um, graph is, if I just uh, draw on this for a second, <clears throat> we're looking for the range of residuals to be more or less linear at the top and the bottom. And uh, we're also looking for the range to be symmetrical that uh, our residuals fits in between. And uh, I think also on here, at some point, I've put on the the means of the residuals for each of the levels, just making the point that the, the residuals are, um, if there are differences amongst the means of the different sires, <clears throat> that we have to control for that. And the, that's we do it by looking at the residuals. That's the whole point of looking at the residual values. OK, so I'm um, going to make my plot, 3, 2, 1. Looks just like that other plot. I'm going to draw on the lines, 3, 2, 1. And um, <clears throat> then I, I'm going to make the means using the aggregate function. Let's just um, make this a bit easier to read. I'm uh, aggregating the standardized residuals by, by sire. And I'm applying the mean to it. So I'm going to put those values in the y variable, 3, 2, 1. <clears throat> and then I'm going to make um, unique fitted values. So I'm, I'm rounding the fitted values um, just based on the unique values, three, two, one. And then I'm adding those points to this plot, three, two, one. So those are those points that I said. Now, all that seems a little like hard work to do that. You have to know some programming to get this plot based on how I just showed you, but a nice thing that you can do that's a, a shortcut. And if you are taking notes while I do this, this is a time to take a note about this, is that the way that most people would check this for an ANOVA is you would just use the normal plot function on your model one or your model object. Let's look down in the console and see what happens when I run this. Three, two, one. And what happens? Oh, this darn window. I'm just going to move this a little bit so you can read that. What happens when you um, when you do that is you get this um, hit return to see the next plot. So I'm going to just put my cursor there. Keep your eye over in the plot window when I hit return. Three, two, one. So this is one of the default diagnostic plots. That's the plain old residuals versus the fitted values. And uh, we're just, again, we're looking for that symmetrical 
Notice here how the residuals range between minus 100 and 100, because these are the raw values of the sire weights relative to the mean. And if notice that I've got another hit return to see the next plot. Oh, there's more. So I'm just going to click down here and hit again, three, two, one. I get an automatic QQ residuals plot. So we've already made one of those. I'm going to just hit it again, three, two, one. Now I get a square root of the standardized residuals. What that does is it, um, the plot that I made, the plot on the web page, is a symmetrical um, positive and negative values, but the square root <clears throat> um, of the residuals makes them all positive. So we're looking at, um, at uh, zero <clears throat> against the fitted values. And then there's one more, three, two, one. And this is just the raw plot of the standardized residuals with a with a um, curve, a curved line. Here, this line um, tracks the mean values of the density of the residuals. And so we're looking a visual way that is a little bit different than looking at these ranges is to look and see whether this line is curved. These are just the default plots, and it's just those four. So uh, you would always, always, always look at these with any model. Yeah, I think we're back to the um, slides now. All right, so we're going to graph our ANOVA. For any test, you need to learn the, the appropriate graph that corresponds to the statistical test you're going to use on your data. A lot of people don't think of it exactly like that. A lot of people think of it, what's the right graph for my data? That's that you you can make those graphs, but when we're doing a statistical test, it's expected that you pick the right graph for the test. Um, and an example of this that I was just talking to one of you earlier about, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine, is uh, when people use bar plots to um, represent a mean value for something that is a continuous variable. You've got the bar going from zero up to the mean value, but actually we should use a dot for that mean with error bars, or better yet, we should use a box plot for all the reasons that I've discussed. And, and for ANOVA, indeed, it's the box plot because we're looking at the mean of a continuous variable. Okay, so we're going to make a good box plot. <clears throat> what does a good box plot mean? Well, let's talk about that. Let me just um, get rid of my annotations. For some reason, my annotations is not going away. Having a lot of technical difficulties today. <clears throat> well, that just won't do if. Oh, I'll get rid of it up here. There we go. <clears throat> oh, a uh, thing that I forgot to show you before we go on and make a good box plot is the Bartlett test. So the Bartlett test is um, a formal test of of um, homoscedasticity. So here um, we're testing whether your your data are different to um, to a uh, homoscedastic state. So this is a test that's it's a little bit like the test for um, <clears throat> for uh, Gaussian, the Shapiro test that we used, where this tests whether your data are different to Gaussian. The uh, Bartlett test whether tests whether your um, data have different variances. So the, this is one that um, I think when you're beginning and learning to think about and learning to do stats a lot, um, this is a valuable test. It, it can confirm your hunch that you have by looking at your data about whether whether you are in a state of homoscedasticity. And here we're just using Bartlett.test. We're inputting our formula weight as a function of sire and then our, our data. And uh, 321, there we go. 
get out the normal stuff. We get out our Bartlett's test certificate statistic, degrees of freedom. That's the number of classes minus one and our p-value. Because our p-value is greater than 0 0.05, there's no difference between our variances. That's what that is interpreted as. And if there is a difference there, we need to think about why, because that violates the assumption of analysis of variance. OK, so now to the graphing. We're just going to make a box plot, and I'm just going to um, Now uh, let's just make the plot. We've done this before, made a box plot. This is weight as a function of sire, our data, our new long, and our main, three, two, one. Now, the main title of this asks, is this box plot good enough? It's not bad, uh, in my opinion. Um, there are a couple of things that I would comment on. Um, one thing is that, um, Unless there's a really good reason to, I like to make plots exactly square. And uh, there's no reason not to have this plot exactly square. In R, we can control that in code or just by dragging the window. And we'll just drag the window today. Sometimes when it's not OK, is if you have longer names down here, and you, if they occlude each other, you can just drag your window wider. Uh, the thing I would critique about this is that the weight doesn't have uh, units that um, it's nice, at least it's something that I like to do all the time, is to superimpose the data points and jitter them so that we can see each and every data point onto the box plot. So sometimes that there's a jargon term for that kind of annotation on a box plot it, or even on its own without the boxes. It's called a strip chart. So I, I always will make a box plot with a strip chart. So um, <clears throat> if we go down here, we're going to make a better graph. And uh, to do that, um, here I'm adding the annotation of the units. Um, I'm adding a title that, that looks a little bit better. I am this. what this uh, CEX argument does is it gets rid of this outlier up here. And the reason I want to get rid of it is because I'm going to redraw the raw, all the raw data, including the outliers, onto that plot. And I don't want to draw a second plot up there. So the CEX is the size of those elements in the plot. So I'm putting it to size zero so that it goes away. Keep your eye on the plot and see how it changes. Three, two, one. So I've just changed the titles and the outlier has gone away. A thing I like to do with ANOVAs, especially one way ANOVAs, is draw a grand mean line. So the overall mean, I'm doing that with the AB line, three, two, one. So we can see how individual means deviate from the overall mean. This is the formal part of the test of ANOVA. I usually wouldn't do that in a publication, but um, I think it's nice for a, for a report that's non-peer reviewed or even for my own eyes um, to, to judge. And then lastly, I'm gonna um, jitter the points with the points function. I'm adding jitter uh, on the x-axis <clears throat> and I'm just creating those um, x-axis places. If I just show that um, the ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives, eight of each correspond to the locations on the graph. And remember, I'm plotting the weight. So the Y is the, the weight variable. Okay, and I'm making, you know, blue dots. Three, two, one. So that's the raw data. You can see our outliers pop back up here. You can also see that the whiskers on the box plots are the range of the data, except for this one, just like we talked about before. Okay, so this is a pretty good plot. It, it shows all the data, gets all the information of the box plot, has informative axis titles with the units, and it um, even has this line of the grand mean to draw the eye. That's a pretty good box plot for this test. <clears throat>
Okay, so now we're just going to get to it and do the test in the alternative. We're going to just about be able to do this in time. So um, if we look at the basic output. We're going to redo our our model here. The only thing I've done different this time is I've been a little more formal. I, this worked perfectly before. I didn't have to do this. But if we look up in our um, new long data set, where is it? It's here. Weight, uh, the sire. Oh, it is a factor. Okay, and I think that that is something that um, that uh, I may have done above. So we don't we don't need this now. Factor is a sire. I was making it with the factor function explicitly a factor, but it is already a factor. I may have done that earlier. I can't remember. OK, so I'm going to redo our model 321. It's going to replace our old one. And then now I'm going to use the um, the summary function. I mentioned one called the ANOVA function. I'm going to actually go ahead and put it here. Next to the M1. And uh, I think in this case. I'm actually going to run the ANOVA function first. Remember what I said about the ANOVA function, and this is a good place to make an important note if you're taking notes, is that the ANOVA function itself merely formats statistical output to the format of what, um, it's a bit old fashioned these days, but it is still called this, uh, is that of an ANOVA table. An ANOVA table is, is organized so that there's one row per effect in a statistical model. And the columns are things like the um, the um, the estimated difference, things like the residual sum of squares, things like the p value and the f value. Okay, so let's let's look at the ANOVA one first. Three, two, one. Sure enough, here we get a column for degrees of freedom, and our rows are sire and residuals. Okay. Here, the residuals, we can think of all the residuals together as the error in our model. I haven't talked a lot about the equation since the regression chapter, but we're usually not interested in that leftover error unless it is to compare how much leftover error there is after we analyze our data. Really, answering that question is another way of thinking about what ANOVA or regression do for us. What we're interested in is the sire row. Here we've got degrees of freedom. This is sometimes called the numerator degrees of freedom. And the residual degrees of freedom is sometimes called the denominator degrees of freedom. Where do these numbers come from? Well, we have 40, 40 observations. The degrees of freedom for a one-way ANOVA is the number of fa factor levels minus one. So we have five, five sires, minus one is four. And the um, the residual error, degrees of freedom, is the total number of samples that you have minus one per level of your, your factor for a one-way ANOVA. So it's 35 minus five, uh, 40 minus five is 35. Here, the sum of squares and mean squares, I'm not going to talk about them very much um, because they're just intermediate values along the way to calculate the F statistic. This is a ratio of, um, of variance within versus between our factor levels. And a way to think about it is that the bigger this ratio is, the bigger the difference will be between those factor levels. Uh, and in this case, our p-value is less than, uh, it's, it's greater than 0.05. And so um, we, we fail to reject the null. If, if there is a difference between the weights, between these sires, we, we don't detect it. Okay, so that's the uh, way to do it. I'm going to do the a summary table. A thing that sometimes is nice to test is, um, what the actual differences are between our our factor levels, and uh, here by default um, the summary 
will give us the differences. Um, it will take one as a reference level. By default, it's just alphabetical. So A will be our reference level. We can set that. I haven't done it here, but it will tell us what the difference is between A and B and whether or not that's significant. A and C, whether it's significant, A and D and so forth. So three, two, one. And actually, I forgot because I've done an, an ANOVA. Um, it just gives us an ANOVA table, but the the um, if I change this to linear model, LM, three, two, one, boom, and then do a summary. There we go. This is the what I was talking about, the contrast. So here the overall mean is 715. And uh, it's um, highly significant. Of course, we're not interested in whether the mean weight of broilers is different to zero. It's not really an interesting question. Of course it is. But uh, we might be interested in whether sire B is different to sire uh, A. And actually, it is. <laughs> so we get a little bit of a different, more nuanced result. And we're also looking at the estimate, which is very easy to interpret. Furthermore, we get the sign. So sire B is less than, it's 50 grams less than sire A. And uh, we also have a significant difference for sire D, the lowest one. See what else we've got uh, here. I've, I've gone quickly through the contrasts. So this is sometimes called, whereas the, um, this one is called the ANOVA table. This one is called the contrasts table. Maybe I'll just show you the ANOVA on our linear model. It's exactly the same to use the ANOVA function for the ANOVA table. Uh, the only difference was that I used LM to calculate exactly the same thing to get the contrast. I do want to slip in um, <clears throat> one last thing, and that's the uh, postdoc tests. You can read this cartoon if you want. It's one of my favorite web cartoons, XKCD. Um, and I'm just going to show this one. This is um, postdoc test. Went through a little bit on the web page of the different kinds of postdoc tests. And uh, the Bonferroni adjustment is one that you should learn about. Um, every working scientist should uh, immediately know what I mean when I say the Bonferroni adjustment. So you can read about that on the website and run the code. But the one that is in wide, widest practice um, and you also must know about, because it's in wider practice than the Bonferroni adjustment, um, it is, um, it's more important than Bonferroni, but it's based on Bonferroni. Um, why is it in wider practice? It's because it's, um, the Bonferroni is conservative uh, compared to the Tukey test, and the HSD part of this Tukey test stands for Honestly Significant Differences. It's um, this one adjusts for differences in sample size and uh, variance, and because of that, it's it is considered um, more accurate than the Bonferroni. The Bonferroni, like I said, is conservative, or or another way of thinking about it is you're you're more likely, you're less likely to detect the difference than you are with a real difference, if it exists, than you are with Tukey, which is why the Tukey HSD is. It's more important. Let's just look at the output real quick. <clears throat> I need to run. Um, the two key only works for analysis of variance. So let me run my AOV model and then run this again. OK, so what have we got here? This is the two key multiple comparison of means 95% family wise confidence level. So we scroll to this table. It looks a little confusing at first. But what it is, is it's a uh, all possible comparisons, all possible post-doc comparisons <clears throat> um, adjusted significantly for um, doing multiple tests on the same data set. Why do we need to adjust them? Actually, it's explained perfectly well in that cartoon, but I explained it before a little bit when I was talking about false positives. And uh, you increase the likelihood of having a false positive when you 
conduct multiple tests on the same data set, which is exactly the, the subject of that cartoon. So here, what we should see if we look down this list is we should see every possible comparison of all the pairs. So B to A, C to A, D to A, and so forth <clears throat> with a test that's been adjusted for multiple comparisons. And here, unlike the contrast table, which only did a few tests, here we're asking, is anything different once we adjust it? And once we adjust it, nothing is actually different. There's too much variation to tease out a difference in this data set. So this is a very common test, and it's also very, very commonly reported in peer-reviewed papers. So this is an important one to know about and do. Right, that's it for our time. We're a little bit over, but I'm, I'm happy with getting through all of this material. I talk a little bit about um, how you can plot the two key, and um, there's an alternative, a non-parametric form of the analysis of variance called the Kruskal-Wallis uh, test, which I'm not going to demonstrate in the interest of time, but I do definitely encourage you to, to check this out. The last thing I do on this page is um, afterthought is inflict you with um, some of the um, equations that underlie real analysis of variance and uh, a little program I wrote for fun on this page that manually calculates the analysis of variance. So I'll spare you of that for today and then the practice exercises. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording, take any questions if there are any, <clears throat> 